Welcome to Point by Point, conversations, interviews, and legal commentary for today's business professionals. Brought to you by Waller. Even during a pandemic, hospitals and healthcare providers are required to protect and preserve patient privacy. But there are plenty of real life scenarios that aren't always black and white. And Waller's Beth Pittman and Nathan Kotkamp will help listeners navigate HIPAA and other privacy concerns during this challenging time. Healthcare in the United States has never been easy, but with the coronavirus pandemic, a visit to the doctor's office can be risky or not an option altogether. This crisis has become a moment for telehealth, which connects patients to doctors wherever they may be. Although telehealth has been around for a while, recent updates to regulations and a surge in demand has made it the easiest way to deliver care. On today's episode of Point by Point, I'm joined by Beth Pittman and Nathan Kotkamp. Beth and Nathan are both partners in our healthcare compliance and operations practice group who work with healthcare providers and healthcare IT companies on a variety of compliance and regulatory matters, particularly around patient privacy, data security, and telehealth. Beth and Nathan, we are really looking forward to talking to you today. In a short period of time, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted a variety of industries, but most of all, healthcare providers. Can you first speak to the drivers for the shifts in care delivery models and why telehealth has really taken off in the last couple of weeks? Sure, Morgan. Thank you for having us on the show today. Um, there are a few drivers to the push towards telehealth. The first is in the midst of the coronavirus outbreak, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services and the Office for Civil Rights have taken steps to make health care services more accessible through telehealth particularly for those who are at high risk of complications from the virus. Um, in addition, there are a number of care settings that are limiting or altogether closing access to, to in-person services. In order for those providers to continue to see patients, they're now shifting into more of a telehealth setting. Um, just think of dermatology, dentistry, uh, other areas of health care that are, that are able to carry out much of their work through a telehealth platform. So you mentioned certain patients who are at risk um, or maybe have high risk of complications. So maybe, you know, patients with diabetes, um, heart disease, how are patients, maybe they don't have coronavirus, but just those patients that are, um, you know, dealing with chronic diseases. um, How would you say those in particular are, are dealing with this with via telehealth? Sure. The physicians that treat patients that have chronic illnesses are able to do remote patient monitoring through the use of blood pressure cuffs or other types of devices that help that help send the information to them. They can call the patients with that audio visit can audio visual you know, visit can can meet with them and determine how they're how they're complying with their requirements. Are they are they taking their medications? Are they eating the right kind of foods? Are they getting out and exercising like they're supposed to? Um, it helps significantly in patient compliance with regard to chronic care management. So, Nathan, I'm curious, are you seeing that there are certain areas of healthcare in particular that are most ideal for telehealth or certain clients that are asking you the most questions about this right now? I'd say the, the obvious one is mental health services. Um, ordinarily, they're, they're delivered in person, but uh, it's an easy sort of thing to do. Uh, it doesn't have the limitations of um, having to uh, be concerned about you know, is the, uh, are the diagnostic elements going to be good enough if you're doing dermatology over video, for example? Um, those, those challenges don't exist. Um, I, I think anything that involves um, regular interventions with physicians where you, you're simply checking in, those are going to be the other ones where it's going to help a lot. So I'm curious, Beth, you mentioned earlier CMS, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Are there particular regulations that expand the use of telehealth that providers should be aware of? Yes. Under CMS, under the Medicare rules, they have expanded the the definition of telehealth and to to allow delivery of services from a pa- to a patient who's at their home. And also, they've also expanded it beyond the rural areas where originally it was limited to a certain geographic area, but now is expanded to to all healthcare providers and in any geographic area. The um, the main advantage is that they can provide services to a patient as they shelter at home. Nathan, do you have anything to, to noteworthy that you know in terms of reimbursement? If I'm a healthcare provider, okay, there are advantages for us to be able to do this. This is going to provide an additional revenue stream where otherwise our practice may be limited or completely cut off in the, the number of patients that we can see right now? Oh, absolutely. Uh, obviously, cash flow is a major issue for 
providers across the country. Um, there's obviously a lag time in, in providing services and getting paid for it, but keeping the pipeline of, of patients and reimbursement open uh, is, is really an important bridge uh, from where we are today and where we need to, to get to once we're out of this situation. So I, I think we'll, we will probably over time to see some evolution in the way in which telehealth is reimbursed. Um, obviously, that we're not there yet, but um, that's got to be a place that we're going to be moving to after this situation. Yeah. And, and Morgan, we've also seen uh, not only has CMS expanded telehealth reimbursement, but most of the commercial payers have followed suit and have also made adjustments to increase their reimbursements or telehealth. One other thing to keep in mind is that these uh, expansions, these measures, at least at the moment, are temporary. So uh, just be mindful of when uh, these are cut off. There may be some adjustments that need to be made. Yeah, one thing, too, is that we've had a lot of questions about how to code for the Medicare billing, and CMS has been changing that. And so as they as they have made the changes, they've also made it clear that if, if claims have been submitted under under their prior guidance, those will be paid and there won't there should not be a delay. But they have specific coding requirements for telehealth during this emergency. OK, that all makes sense. And I mean, it seems like a, a good option, obviously, for those that are either faced with the coronavirus or those that are sheltering in place. And it's a great option for these physician practices in particular. If I'm a provider, what are the key pieces of information that I should be aware of in terms of compliance and reimbursement changes? You've obviously obviously noted a few of those. But Nathan, I'll, I'll start with you. Is there anything you know as a provider that I should be aware of? Well, I think. Uh, first and foremost is to, to recognize that um, the, the expansion of telehealth is not a free-for-all. Uh, you still need to be worried about all the ordinary things that you worry about in, in medical practice. Um, good documentation, uh, patient confidentiality and privacy. You know, these are not uh, consults that you want to be doing in, in your kitchen while your kids are doing their homework with remote schooling and things like that. Um, I also think it's a good idea uh, when you're talking with patients and there is that element of diagnostic component to it to let patients understand that there may be limitations. It's not the same as, as being able to lay hands on a patient uh, and helping them understand that I think can go a long way in not only uh, assuring the patient, but also helping with some uh, liability risk issues. Anything from a, you know, a licensure or insurance perspective? Yeah, licensure is a big deal when it comes to telehealth and telemedicine. Um, right now, uh, the licensure is handled at the state level. I don't see any change coming to that anytime soon. Uh, and there is some suspension of some of the rules, um, but sort of on the backside of when this crisis is over, uh, certain uh, states require registrations of uh, physicians in other states. Um, some have specific rules as to where telemedicine can be performed either on the patient end or the provider end. Again, I think we're going to see changes in all those. But once these rules are lifted, at least for an initial period of time, we're going to have to go back to the existing rules that are on the books. Yeah, that, that's right. For the any anything that's not Medicare reimbursed, the state rules would definitely govern what you can do or can't do with telehealth. And many of the states do require HIPAA compliant technology. So even though Medicare has made some, CMS has made some some waivers in that regard. They still need to check the state laws and make sure that the technology that's being used does meet the requirements. And on the licensure front, uh, there are several states that are waiving some of their licensure requirements. So you don't have to go through the Board of Medicine, for example. If you find a, find a patient who you can help and you just sort of go in and do it um, during the period of, of emergency declaration, they're going to allow that. But obviously, once the emergency is finished, then you'd have to register for licensure uh, for telemedicine and things like that. Are there any uh, areas in particular where you're seeing there's some confusion around, you know, codes that look like they're on the list and are able to provide distant site providers? I'm curious if there's any confusion that's out there right now that is worth clearing up. Well, sure. There's, there was some confusion about the place of service. To, you know, usually you would have the you would have a certain a certain place of service you had to use for telehealth, but what they've done now is they've changed that so that the place of service that you use in coding it is is the normal place of service where you would provide the face to face visit, and then they have a specific modifier that you attach to that which is ninety five and that does then explain to the that it is a telehealth emergency specific event. 
One of the other areas of confusion in sort of curiosity is uh, dental practices. Dentists can still do some telehealth. Uh, it's pretty amazing to think that uh, using a phone and sticking the camera in your mouth would be effective, but um, that does exist. Obviously, it has limitations, but uh, I've heard some chatter about that that's been interesting. Oh, yeah. We've had a lot of dental clients with questions about that, and that is that's definitely a dental board or state-specific issues. And some of the states have specific dental teledentistry laws, but not many. Others have telehealth laws that include dentists. And then some, like Texas, for instance, don't allow it at all. So it, it is, um, that's definitely a state-specific question. And it's confusing for, for the dentists. That definitely makes sense. Uh, what about physical therapy or occupational therapy? It seems like there's been some confusion around that as well. There has, there are codes for that. However, at this time, CMS does not include physical therapists and oc occupational therapists in their definition of telehealth um, qualified providers, but some states do for Medicaid and a lot of the commercial, most of the commercial payers also though do provide those services and reimburse for them. So do you all think that the shift towards telehealth is here to stay? You know, some of these um, changes will stay in place for a while or how will things look once the pandemic has, has ended? I hope so. I think it's really a game changer for a lot of physicians because they can they can provide services to their clients that wouldn't require the client, the patient to come into the office normally. And it frees up some additional space for them. So they can use exam rooms for appointments that require face-to-face -face visits. And that really gives them addition, an additional reimbursement avenue. I couldn't agree more. I think what we're probably going to see is a return to the previous arrangements with respect to health, telehealth for a very short period of time. And then everyone's going to realize how good it was, all things considered, with respect to this particular element of healthcare delivery uh, in this current time. And then I think we're going to see state laws loosening, federal law is going to loosen as well. Um, I, I think the, the parts that are I'm going to be watching that are interesting is, is some of the um, turf protection that I'm sure that we're going to be seeing. Do we want providers from other states coming in and, and providing care for our patients? Those also raise some you know, ethical questions, which is, you know, were you caring for those patients right now anyway? So are they really stealing patients? But those are things that are sort of uh, social questions that we're going to have to be answering um, but I do think this this whole telehealth initiative has the potential to really provide some necessary services in underserved communities. Both of you have mentioned some state specific differences. I know Beth, you were referencing earlier um, just on the dental front, you know some of the differences on a state by state level. Any other state specific differences that may be noteworthy for our listeners? Sure. The Many of the states have, have specific requirements about the type of telehealth technology that can be used or the type of telehealth services. Some states will allow audio only, some require audio visual, and some do also allow where the patient can take a photograph, send it to the provider, and the provider can review that at a later time. So it does vary from state to state about what, you know, concerning the type of technology and telehealth service that can be provided. The other thing that differs from state to state is the requirements for an initial patient relationship. There are certain states that require telehealth to be conducted only after a physician has met with the patient for the first time in person. So that's obviously a, a big deal as we're trying to roll this out. The other thing uh, that comes into play, too, is that various states have different rules with respect to their controlled substances rules and what can be prescribed via telemedicine. Uh, so again, I, I suspect we'll see more harmony of that as things go forward. But right now, uh, it really is a state-by-state -state thing that you need to be careful about what it is you're prescribing. Oh, and that reminds me, there's, there's one other thing, patient consent. Many of the states do require that the patient consent to the use of telehealth. And the OCR enforcement discretion does advise the providers to notify the patients prior to the prior to using telehealth that, that there will be using telehealth and there's a risk of you know releasing the information or the you know it may not be as private as it would in a face-to-face -face conversation. So that's that is something that needs to be included in the services is to make sure they have an appropriately designed consent form for the patients to execute. 
So that's interesting. Have the have the patient privacy rules loosened as a result of the regulations passed recently? What changes are happening on the, the HIPAA front that you would want to know? I'll, I'll start with that. I think the biggest change right now is a enforcement discretion loosening of the rules with respect to the specific technology. There is technology that's recognized as being HIPAA compliant and more, more importantly, several technologies that are recognized by the OCR as not being HIPAA compliant, but at least for the moment, um, w- with certain exceptions, uh, the OCR has essentially said you can go ahead and use a, a much broader array of uh, options to be able to communicate with patients. The, the one thing I would uh, caution is that a lot of folks are, or a lot of vendors are going to be jumping on the bandwagon and they're going to be promoting their services being HIPAA compliant. And uh, there's there's real there's no official way of knowing that. Um, so just be careful of, of who the vendors are that you're using um, and continue to, to monitor the OCR, frequently asked questions on the topic. Yeah, that's correct. And the OCR's enforcement discretion is based on a good faith use of the telehealth. And what that means is that you, do, you can't willfully violate the HIPAA law. So the enforcement discretion does not suspend the HIPAA privacy, security, or breach notification laws but it does for this for this time period state that they will not enforce penalties against someone for violation of those. So you're still required to comply with the privacy and security laws and the provide notice in the event of a breach. But at this point in time, there has been a suspension of the penalties with regard to good faith use. So that means that you know if someone if some bad actor comes in and zoom bombs on a on a telehealth call, then that person would still be prosecuted by the government for doing that. Um, obviously, when things are available in uh, video form, there may be uh, a tendency to do things like post on social media uh, a, a image of somebody's really wild tattoo or something like that. Uh, OCR would consider that to be personally identifiable information. And so uh, just be really careful about the crossover between social media and what you do in your practice. Privacy rules are going to always apply. So what are some of Beth, what are some of the risk considerations that these practices should have with particular platforms like Zoom or FaceTime, uh, some of the other ones that we've been hearing a lot about? Sure. Many of these, like Zoom, for instance, have got have received some publicity concerning the the lack or absence of security security protocols. So it's important to, first of all, make sure that you're using the most current and up-to-date software that they have available. Those on your phone, if you if there's an if you have an update notice, you need to be sure to update the software for Zoom or FaceTime. And also to put into place the, the types of privacy restrictions that they recommend. Um, Zoom has a waiting room and they suggest that you use the waiting room function so you can control the people who enter enter your telehealth session. So Beth, you mentioned earlier the OCR enforcement discretion. Can you speak to that a little more and who's who's covered within that and who's not? Sure. The OCR enforcement discretion is limited to healthcare providers. It does not extend to insurance companies, um, for instance, insurance companies that, that offer teledoc. Those teledoc services do not are not covered by this OCR enforcement discretion. It is also it does also not cover um, business associates such as management services organizations or dental service organizations who might contract for tele tele dental or telehealth services. Um, those services are not would not fall under this enforcement discretion either, unless unless the provider is also a contractor. However, I'll chime in and say that uh, those rules may be changing over time. The the longer this goes on, the more change we're going to see from the OCR. In fact, um, they've now released three different enforcement issues or statements, and they aren't coming out at any regular intervals. So it's very possible the the rules are going to expand even further. Uh, Along those lines, I'm interested to know, are there any particular resources where, where you would point people um, to read up on more information on this, either on Waller's website or through some of the regulatory agencies who are continuing to release updates? I'm sure. Waller has a has a COVID-19 resource page on our website. OCR also has a specific page directed toward the their enforcement discretion that relates to all of the enforcement discretion that's issued with regard to COVID-19. So you can go to the um, hhs.gov and then Office of Civil Rights. Well, it sounds like we need to stay tuned for more information as this continues to to play out and evolve. And I think we can all agree that it's a positive evolution for the healthcare industry and something that we've been talking about for 
a long time with, um, you know, patients having greater access to telehealth. Maybe I think, Nathan, as you pointed out earlier, there's there's not a whole lot of positive coming out of this pandemic, but hopefully we can see some some small silver linings. And I think this um, access to telehealth and more providers looking into how they might be able to provide at least certain aspects of their um, care delivery in, in this kind of setting. So it's it's definitely um, exciting. And I, I think, you know, there's still what remains a lot of questions to be answered and um, you're both great resources on that and, and tracking it regularly. Thank you for listening to this episode of Point by Point, brought to you by Waller. Visit the news and insights section of our website to listen to more episodes, subscribe to the podcast, find show notes and more. 